name's Matt Parrott. I'm, as Lindsay said, I work for Forest Research full time, but I dabble in a bit of botany and other things as well, particularly like the uplands, but uh, let's go. So most people's impression of conifers comes down to two things really. We just saw a Christmas tree there, but also these green deserts, vast areas planted up with non-native conifers. And we'll get some ideas as to what you think about that at the end of this as well. So an introduction to conifers in the British Isles. We're going to look at what a conifer is. Um, we're going to give you a brief history of conifers in Britain. And we're going to look at identifying what I think are the most common forest conifers. Now, there are going to be a lot of others out there that you'll see. I think in one of Chris's or pullouts from the database, he had about 10 different fir species. So he's in a good vice county for firs. There. So what is a conifer? Well, they're, they're an old plant group and they first appeared in the late Carboniferous around 300 million years ago. They're gymnosperms, so A, they don't have flowers and the seeds, the ovules are naked. There is no fruit connected with them. Uh, the leaves are always simple and single or parallel veined. Most importantly, they have separate male, i.e. the pollen and female cones, but they don't have flowers. Now, on some trees, those male and female cones will be on the same tree. And on others, like you and juniper, they'll actually be on different trees. And they're wind pollinated, so generally insects aren't involved. There are eight families. Now, the figure in brackets is the number of species in each family. Um, Skydoctyaceae, Philocladaceae, Cephalotaxaceae, Podocarpaceae, and more or less Araceae, you're really not going to see here at all. We've got one exception here in the Araceae. Uh, Cupressaceae, Taxaceae, and Pinaceae, however, are the ones you're going to see pretty regularly. I'm also going to put in an honorary conifer, the Ginkgoaceae, just one species left of that one now, which you might see in towns occasionally and sometimes parks and gardens as well. So approximately 627 species in total. And I say approximately because every couple of months the taxonomy shifts. And usually things that were subspecies become species, but vice versa as well. So realistically, those three families are the ones we're going to be looking at. And today we're going to focus mainly on the Pinaceae. So what about conifers in the British Isles? Well, like so much of our natural history, it's down to two things really, the Ice Age and Homo sapiens, us. So we've got three native taxa. I'm not gonna worry about subspecies at this point before somebody jumps up and down about that, but you, Taxus baccata, Scots pine, Pinus sylvestris, and juniper, juniperus communis. Now, juniper is the most widespread conifer in the world. It's got a completely circumboreal distribution right around the Northern Hemisphere. And Scots pine is the second. Uh, you comes quite a bit lower down the table. But as Lindsay alluded a little while ago, um, we've got two others. And this is really going to make some people jump up and down. But Leyland cypress, or Cupressus cross Leylandii, um, no the name change for those that haven't caught up with those yet. So this arose in 1888 at a place called Lake Nabor on the Welsh borders. And it's the result of two species, Cupressus macrocarpa and Cupressus nucleotensis, that would never have met in the wild. But lucky for them, we grew them side by side at Lake Horland, and this seedling appeared, and thus began a generation of infuriated neighbours and hedge planters. But um Yep, native, I'm afraid. And the other one is a bit more Scottish, the Dunkeld or hybrid larch, or Larix marshlinsii. And this was a little bit later. It was first noticed in 1904, but it had certainly been growing for a few years by then. So those are native taxa as well. Given that we've got so few native taxa, the majority of the conifers we're gonna be seeing out and about are exotic introductions. So our good old Christmas tree, I'm going to go back to the old fashioned Christmas tree, if you like, the Norway spruce. That was here pre-1500. 
So it's been here a pretty long time, but almost certainly for forestry purposes. The other biggie is horticulture. And nowadays this brings in far more species than forestry does. And they're, they're spreading. Some of them make good street trees, things like Dawn Redwood, which are popping up all over the place. And I'm sure if anybody's been to any of my courses before, I usually mention uh, Bracknell Railway Station as having some pretty scratty Dawn Redwoods out front. But here we've got um, Atlas Cedar, and that's at Bodnant Gardens. Now, that poor thing's actually looking far worse for wear these days, thanks to a disease. And on the right hand side are the female cones of Pinus, um, sorry, Abies coriana. Very, very common little tree in gardens, mainly because it cones abundantly and from a very young age. So these are the big bad quite a lot of the time and uh, formerly my employers and still kind of my employers, but the Forestry Commission. So this was formed in 1919 with one purpose only, to replace the strategic timber reserve. Uh, World War I resulted in a massive loss of forests and prior to that, prior to that as well. But really this was to replace timber to form pet props, should we ever need it again. So bear those origins in mind and they certainly don't apply today and things are changing, but that was the origin. But what we're here to look at really is identification. And where do we start? What are the key features we look at? Um, and this particular one illustrates a very fine point, location. Location is all, because if you're in the forest, you're really looking at a, a narrow palette of maybe 10, 12, possibly 16 species at the most. Generally, there are a few exceptions, but if you're in an urban setting, you've got a, a much bigger suite of species that you're gonna be looking for. Um, if you see a vastly overgrown tree in someone's front garden that looks like it used to be a hedge, you can pretty much bet it's our old buddy and native Leylandii we're looking at. It's not always that straightforward though. Let's mention some resources briefly. Um, these are just a few of the ones that are available. I'm still a bit of a stickler for the Mitchell book. Uh, the illustrations are very poor, but the descriptions are good. And I think something that's commonly said about his descriptions are he looked at the material. He didn't just copy somebody else's words. I have to mention John Poland's excellent vegetative key. The second edition boasts a much greater range of conifers. And I really think this is an excellent key. It works extremely well. If you want to get more specialized, the two books below that, monographs such as this one by Ellis Farge on the Pines don't come cheap. Um, the illustrations are excellent. The descriptions are thorough. If you want something a bit more general, but with a good bit of information, look out for Conference of the World by Eckermolde. Um, illustrations, again, are a bit of a downside for this. They're photographs in black and white, but the text is excellent and it's well worth a read if you can find a copy somewhere. Uh, there are some really good online resources as well. And in particular, I'd like to point you at the Arboretum Vespalar. There's a guy there called Jan Delang who produces free to download keys, which are superb. One tiny snag, they are complete keys. So they contain all species of the genera. And that can provide a bit of a tripping point if you're out in the British countryside. But if you happen to wander to an arboretum, then they're very useful. And I should at this point mention botanic collections like the Arboreta. In Scotland, we've got places like Doik and Ben Moore, which, which have excellent collections. And also Kilman Arboretum over on the West Coast, which is uh, free and run by Forestry and Land Scotland these days. And most of these places have excellent labeling and provide you with a really good place to go and test your ID skills or just go and enjoy some trees. Uh, but there are many, many others. Equipment. Okay, your trusty times 10 hand lens is gonna be your best friend if you're looking at conifers. But one of the big issues we have with conifers is the foliage, the bits we need to identify things are often 20 or 30 meters above our heads. So a pair of binoculars, especially for looking at cones, can be very useful. Woolly hats, 
not necessarily conifer themed. Highly recommended because the best time to look at conifers is during the winter. So warm clothing is essential. Now, I would say um, keep warm, keep safe when you're out there, but conifers are at their very best at this time of year. You don't have those horrible broadleaves getting in the way and cluttering things up. Better still, things like buds are at their very best and buds can be a really useful feature when you're looking at conifers. And finally, unless you're into mosses and liverworts or vegetative ID, there's not a lot else to go and look at during the winter. So why not have a look at some conifers? Let's dive into the identification itself. So before we get anywhere near a tree, we might want to have a quick look at its form or its general shape. And this can be informative. Um, on the left-hand side there, we see quite a traditional conifer shape, sometimes described as flame-shaped or teardrop-shaped. And this is Cupressus milkitensis, the milk cypress. In the middle is a, a very distinctive shape indeed. This one is particularly narrow, but this is Picea amorica, the Serbian spruce, and it always has this lovely narrow tapered appearance, which is a snow shedding adaptation. And John Poland has an excellent description for the branches of this and it's ski jump branches. So they start off quite tightly and pressed to the main trunk and then they flip up at the far end. And on the right, a species that really doesn't need too much in the way of ID. Uh, and that's monkey puzzle, Aracaria aracana, um, instantly recognizable, 70 miles an hour in a car, you'd still see that. Uh, Matt, sorry to, to come in here. Your, your volume's just very occasionally fading a wee bit and then coming back. I don't know if it's your audio or not. We can hear you, don't worry. Just occasionally you get a little bit of a fade and then you come back with uh, with normal volume. Great. If there's, nothing you can, if there's nothing you can do about it, fine. We can all hear you, don't worry. It's just occasionally it's, it's happening. Cheers. Great. I'll, uh, I don't think there's much I can do about it, but I'll uh, keep an eye on it. So looking at bark, uh, this can be helpful again because very often the foliage is way above our heads so sometimes looking at bark can give us some helpful clues. Uh, we've got the lovely orange flaky bark there of Scots pine which is only in the upper part of the tree and we've got some very sort of blistery looking bark there and that's one of the abia species. Now those blisters are filled with resin so don't get tempted to pop them because nine times out of ten that will go straight into your eye and Smells great, but it stings like hell. So try and avoid that. And below that, we've got a more ridged and furrowed bark. And that one's Pinus nigra. But as I mentioned earlier, are at the best in the winter and can give us some really good pointers to identification. And we're looking at overall shape and color sometimes, but also the presence or absence of resin. So the bottom two pictures there, you can see they've got a sort of a whitish coating. Very often that starts off transparent, but then gradually gets more misty as the season goes on. And on the far right hand side, we can see some bud scales that are actually recurved back. And that's Pinus penasta, which you don't see that much in Scotland, but is about in the rest of the British Isles, certainly. So buds can be helpful and they're well worth having a look for. Cones. Now, if you're ever looking at a conifer and you're not sure about the ID, I would say definitely try and find some cones or look for some parts of cones that can all be helpful. And we're looking really at shape overall. Um, are they upright on the tree, like the one with the green sticky out bits there? Um, do they hang downwards like the one below it? And are they actually cones or are they more berry-like? So we've got juniper there and we've also got the fleshy aerial of yew, which isn't a cone at all. So cone shape, size, whether it sits upright or hangs down on the branches and colour, especially when they're immature, can be very, very helpful. Now, one tiny little nudge here is that when the cones are unripe, the scales are usually folded tightly together. So as they dry out and mature, they open up. And that can change the appearance a little bit. But really what it all comes down to is leaves. 
And with any conifer ID, if you can get your eye into where the leaf joins the twig, and how it joins the twig, that can give you the genus within seconds. Once you've got the genus, you've eliminated a lot of comp competitors, you can start zooming in. So looking at how is that needle attached? Is it even a needle? Is it flattened and scale-like? Or is it perhaps more feathery looking? So here are some of the main species that we're gonna find. And by far and away, the most common out in the forest is spruce. This accounts for well over 50% of commercial forestry plantations, in particular one species, which we'll come on to shortly. So looking at the image on the left-hand side, we're particularly looking at where this needle joins the stem. And you can see this little woody projection. And this goes by the name of a peg in non-botanical terms. And these are particularly visible when the needles drop, which if anybody can remember the old fashioned Christmas tree, the Norway spruce, the needles drop with abandon into your carpet and seem to stay there for months afterwards. But if you look at those twigs where the needles have naturally fallen, you'll see these little rows of pegs left behind. Now, if you try and pull them off, very often a strip of bark comes away with them. So you don't see that peg as clearly. So look for a branch which is perhaps very shaded where the needles have fallen off and look for those pegs. And the cones on spruces always, always hang down. Okay, so that's a key feature of those. So good old Sitka spruce, the most common forestry species in the British Isles. So this is well over 50% species. So what are the things that distinguish it? Um, I know John Poland says smells like bananas if you crush your foliage and I'm still struggling with that one. But for me the quickest and easiest way to split the spruces is to look at whether the needles are the same colour all over or whether they have distinctly differently coloured surfaces and we're talking naked eye here not using your hand lens. So these needles are discolorous, so they have different colours. And the picture on the left shows the underside of the needles. And you can see we've got a very silvery, botanical blue, glaucous appearance there. And the picture on the right hand side shows the upper side of the needles. And these are a nice lush dark green. And you can see this from a distance. So it very quickly can separate out these species. Very importantly, they're prickly and an old forester's trick used to be you grab the tree and if you stay holding on to it um, it's not Sitka spruce. If, if on the other hand you're saying ouch and jumping back from it it's Sitka spruce. And there we have a, a little Sitka spruce cone and I think these are best described as stubby and papery. They're about thumb length possibly a little bit more and with this species in particular, they litter the ground underneath the tree and are very easy to find. So have a look out for those. Norway spruce. So this is the traditional Christmas tree, which has largely been usurped by the abies. Um, if we look at these needles, if you've got your lens on there, you'd see lines of white dots. Now, those are stomata, and with a lot of the conifers, the stomata are covered with a little waxy plug, which helps to reduce excessive moisture loss. But those needles will be the same colour all over. So we're describing those as concolorous. One of the ways of separating these species previously was to look at a cross section and whether the needles were flattened or rhombic in cross section. And I struggle with that. I know a lot of other people struggle with it. Whether they're discolorous or concolorous separates them just as quickly and much more easily. You don't need to carry a razor blade with you or roll them between your fingers. So on the right hand side of the screen there, we've got a, a Sitka spruce cone on the right and a Norway spruce cone on the left. They're much bigger. The 
colors quite different. They're more of a rich chestnut brown. And very importantly, the, the scales are much more imbricate. They're laid much more tightly against the body of the comb. I describe these as looking like pangolin tails. Uh, and in the past, this has caused people to leap back and say, what's a pangolin? But given its um, early association with COVID, I had to get the C word in somewhere. Um, most people now know that this is what a pangolin looks like. And for my money, that looks just like in a rice bruce comb. So I'm going to move on to the pines. Now, the defining feature of the pines is that their needles are held in bunches um, known botanically as fascicles of two, three, or five. Now, occasionally you'll get something that doesn't follow the rules. Um, so you will occasionally get a four or a six or a one, especially when the trees are very young. Now, the important thing about this is um, if you're using stace, uh, these are described as short shoots. So that whole structure is a short shoot. And essentially it's, it's like a spur shoot on an apple or a rowan. Uh, don't be tripped up by that. So if, if you get into the stace key and look at short shoots, that is what he's talking about. Just there botanically, that's absolutely spot on. So fascicles, importantly, they, these are shed as a whole. So we wouldn't get a single needle falling. They would fall as that fascicle bunch. And quite often you can find these in a dense mat underneath the trees they form from. Now, pretty much all of the trees I'm going to look at today and the ones you're going to see in the wild in Scotland, in forests, are two needle pines. There are three and fives are out there. So things like Pinus radiata has three needles and Pinus pukey has five needles. And you will find those, but not very common at all. So Scots pine, second most common forestry species in Scotland, certainly. As I said, this is a, a two needle pine. And importantly, the needles are usually less than 10 centimeters long. So to separate out the two needle pines, needle length is a really good place to start. If you look closely at that needle on the left, you will see that it's also got a, a very glaucous or botanical blue color to it. Um, that separates out nicely from some of its other lookalikes. Secondly, the bark is very distinctive. So I've got a close up of the bark in the middle picture there. And on the right hand side, the left hand tree in that picture clearly shows the nice orange bark in the upper crown. Now you don't get this lower down the tree. It's only in the younger parts of the crown but it's readily visible, especially this time of year when you've got good low light that can penetrate the canopy easily. I'd also draw your attention to the growth form, if you like, in this picture on the right hand side, because we can see the Scots pine's got a kind of more of a, a spreading growth form, whereas the tree on the right, lodgepole pine is much more columnar, it's much tighter. And here we can see the effect of that glaucous foliage from a distance. Now, this picture was taken somewhere, somewhere on the North York Moors, and it just highlights really quickly how you can pull out Scots pine from the stand of lodgepole pine and other things. It stands out like a sore thumb, I think. Not always easy to see when you've got the foliage in your hand, but take a step back and look at it from the side, and you get this lovely glaucous appearance. I mentioned lodgepole pine there, and this is the other very common two needle pine with needles that are less than 10 centimeters long. If we look up into the tree of a lodgepole pine, we will often see quite a lot of cones still attached for many, many years. Now bear in mind that the cones form at the tip of new growth, and each of those pairs of cones, in this case you can see, usually there's more of them, um, represents that tip of a growing shoot and one year's growth between them. So for each whirl of cones, that's one year. Now I've seen these on trees, 25, 30 years old, still attached. 
it's a really good feature, just a quick glance up in the tree. If the cones are hanging on for that long, it's not Scott's pine. And if we can get a close look at the cones, we look at the tip of each scale, we can see that there are little sharp spines or prickles attached to those tips. Now those do wear off with time, but you can usually find them. Now it's, young cones are absolutely the best for this. And this is a fire adaptation in its native area. I'm going to go back to the form or the shape as well and to the colour to some extent. So lodgepole pine, certainly the subspecies which is grown in forestry, is very upright and very columnar looking. And it's described as yellowish green, but compared to Scots pine, it certainly isn't that glaucous botanical blue colour. And it also doesn't have the orange bark in the upper crown. Lodgepole pine is widely grown in Scotland in forestry. It's less so now because it's been hammered by uh, a pathogen called Dothostroma needle blight or red band needle blight. And a lot of it's being hammered quite badly by that. But it's still out there and you will find it. Going to move on to the silver firs. Now, these are sometimes called the true firs silver firs fits just as nicely. Again, just to reinforce this point, we're going to identify these conifers. Look at the foliage and look at how it's attached to the twigs in particular. And in this case, try and pull one off. And what you'll see is a little circular scar left behind. And if you look at the needle, it'll have the appearance of an octopus or a sink plunger, something of that nature. And this is one of the key characters for knowing you're looking at a, a true fur or an abie species. Now, if you're looking at a fur, I would say, look at the buds next before you do anything else. Find some buds and look at them. I'll explain why a bit later. But also take a good step back from the tree and whip out your trusty binoculars and see if you can see any cones now, in silver firs, the cones are always, always upright and they shatter in situ. So they generally don't fall to the ground intact. If you're very lucky and there's a storm before the cones are matured, you may get a few. But looking at this cone, um, this is actually Abies coriana again. You can see we've got the blue colour of the main cone scales and then we've got these little green tongues that are sticking out. Now those are bracts and each bract is associated with one scale and whether they stick out or whether they're inside the cone can be a useful feature. So as I said, these shatter in situ so you don't find the cones on the ground very often at all, but the scales do drift down to below the tree and a word of caution with things below trees, squirrels, small children and adults like to move things around the forest. So do keep an eye out for that as well. But if you've got a lot of them under the tree you're interested in, it's a reasonably safe bet they've come from above. So here's one of these scales on the left and the main part of the scale is the larger part here and the little sort of tongue shaped bit with that accumulate tip is the bract. And if you imagine those stacked on top of one of each other, that bracket would not stick out between the cone scales. So it's described as being inserted. So inserted inside the cone. Okay. And on the right hand side, we've got some of the foliage. Now, for foliage, you really need to look at how it's organized around the tree stem twig. And in this case, we can see the stem very clearly from above and the needles are widely parted. Now if I looked at this end on, I'd just see a single plane of needles. We've got two lengths there, long and short, so two ranks, but they all lie in the same plane, they're nice and flat. Finally, we've got the buds and the buds of grand fir, Abies grandis, are usually very small. 
and they're coated in a thick layer of resin. Um, this starts off transparent very early in the season, but then as winter comes on, it starts to turn this sort of pearly white colour. And sometimes these are described as sort of purpley white. But the key thing is that they've got this thick coat of resin and they're not pointed, they're kind of rounded, globular. Another really common forestry species you're going to come across is noble fir, Abies prosera. And very quickly, this is a very different beast. So for starters, looking at the picture on the right, we can't see the twig, the stem at all when we look down on it. So the needles are arranged all across the stem, obscuring it completely. If you want to look for any buds, you have to really dig for them because they're deeply buried in there. If we turn that foliage to the side, however, we can get an idea of a very distinctive feature. And each of those needles is at pressed against the twig, low down. And this gives them a very distinctive hockey shape, hockey stick shaped appearance. And this pulls it out very quickly from most of the other Abbey species. And in the wider countryside, this is the one you're gonna see. Now, they're not always this glaucous. Certainly if they're growing in shade, they tend to be more green. But up in sunlight, they're much more glaucous. And that brings me to another really important point, especially with firs, but also with spruces. Most of the keys are written for foliage that is accessible from ground level. And if you're relying on foliage, which has come from the top part of the tree, or you've got a young tree that's exposed to good sunlight, it will look different. So the, the crown foliage from a grand fir, remember lower down the fir looks like fish bones, it's widely spread. When it's come from the upper part of the canopy, it can look like this noble fir on the left. The needles are much thicker and they tend to stand upright. So just be aware of that. And here's a, a cone scale from noble fir and compare this bract to the one from the grand fir, it's huge. It sticks out way beyond the edge of the cone scale and it's described as exerted. So just think of it exiting the cone so we can see it. Now, Abbey's cones normally form at the tops of the trees, so they're quite difficult to photograph. Um, but here's an idea on the right hand side here. And to me, these look like little owls sitting on the branches. Somebody described them to me once as gonks. So if, if there are a few of you that remember gonks, but these bracts stick out the cones and they point back downwards and they give the cone this overall sort of brown appearance. And th these can be big, up to about 20 centimetres and fairly heavy. And that can mean they actually twist the branches over. So they can look as though they're hanging down, but um, rest assured they're actually pointing up. Larch. Now they, these are another very common genus in our woodlands. And the defining feature here is that their needles are in clusters of 10, more than 10. And they're also quite delicate and soft. And if you try and roll them between finger and thumb, they just crumple up very quickly. Their other big feature is that they're deciduous. And this time of year, I'm looking out of my window here and I can see golden larch trees up on the hillside. Um, so during the winter, they'll have no needles at all. I'm going to cover the two species today. I'm not going to go into the hybrid. Um, the hybrid's a really funny one because a lot of the textbooks seem to point at this middle ground, ideal specimen. Um, that's not the case. It, it's a hybrid that's very variable. It also back crosses and it's fertile. So we can get things that look just like one of the parents, but they'll actually be hybrids. At the moment, let's look at European larch, Larix decidua. Now with the larches ready, you wanna be looking at the cones, but also the color of the newest twigs. This is best in the winter when you haven't got the needles in the way and the twigs have ripened. Um, but European larch is described as having blonde or pale straw colored twigs. And the cones, I think we can see there, each of the scales is fairly tightly pressed onto the main body of the cone, they don't curve back at all. 
And this is described as imbricate. And essentially this is like the tiles on the roof of a house. They're also sort of egg shaped vaguely in outline and relatively small. And compare this with Japanese larch, which is more common as a forestry tree. And in the left-hand image there, we've got a couple of twigs. And the left-hand one is Japanese larch. Now these are usually much more reddish orange, quite dark um, compared to the Larix decidua European larch, which is on the right-hand side there. So that's a really good tell. Uh, in winter, fantastic. You don't get the needles obscuring the view and the twigs are ripe. Now the cones there, we can see they're quite different. So these cones have got reflex scales and they're also quite globular in shape. They're not like classic sort of egg shape. Um, described sometimes as cabbage-like or roses, it's a, bit, a bit more delicate. So remember the hybrid can be anywhere in between. The cone's usually bigger. The color is usually somewhere in between. And the hybrid is very, very common in forestry because being a hybrid, it's got hybrid vigor and it grows faster and it's a bit more tolerant to some diseases. So from a distance, you can see this color quite well. I don't know how well this is gonna come across on a smaller screen, but in the background, we've got Japanese larch with its nice reddish twigs. And in the middle ground there, that, that's actually hybrid larch. So the colors can really stand out once the needles have finished falling off. I'd urge you to go have a look. When I mentioned the true firs, one of the things I said was they've got sucker-like leaf base attachments. And if you think you've got a fir, the next thing to do is look at the buds. Douglas fir isn't a proper fir. It's full name, Pseudosuga menziesii. Pseudosuga means sort of fake or false suga. And it's not even a suga, a hemlock. It's in a class of its own. And the buds are sharply pointed, um, chestnut brown, and they are unlike almost any other fur species. There's only one that has the same shaped buds. They're much bigger, they're straw colored, and you don't get it outside of botanic gardens. And that's Abies bracteata, or the St. Lucia fur. Um, the other thing is, and I can't show you this, if you crush the needles of this, they will smell very strongly of citronella candles. That's a really good feature. Um, on the right hand side, we can see a mature specimen with nicely ridged and furrowed bark and quite a lot of epiphytes as well growing on it. If you get them in the west of the country. But the absolute giveaway for this species are the cones and they are produced in abundance from a relatively young age and they fall to the ground intact. So what we've got there are exerted bracts and they're distinctly three pronged like little tongues or mouse bums you might say and if anybody hasn't heard the story it goes something along the lines of I'm just going to check my watch for time yeah I've got time so a little mouse scampered up the tree during a storm and the Douglas fir decided that it would give it shelter and offer it some food so the mouse burrowed into a cone and tucked in its mousy mates were a little bit miffed at this and went flying up the tree and dived into this feast. And Douglas fir got a bit annoyed and trapped them all there permanently. And so all we can see are their bums and tails hanging out of these cone scales. So finally, Western hemlock, Suga heterophylla. And there's a really good tell for this one. And again, I'm not sure it's going to show terribly well on your screens there, but the petiole for each needle is adpressed to the stem and this applies to all suga so it's a really good character to get the genus straight away so you'll also see that the stems are hairy and these are proper hairs not like little tiny bits of fluff you have to kind of squint hard to see they're visible without your times 10 hands lens now, the other part of the id is Pretty straightforward if you look at the scientific name, heterophylla, different leaves. And if we look at that picture on the right, we can see that we've got different lengths of needles. Quite happily. So, Suga heterophylla, very common, causes a few concerns because it's shade tolerant, 
which means it can be a problem invading other woodlands. And the seeds are very easily wind dispersed over long distances. So this has got potential problems in terms of invasiveness. So mixed needle sizes there. And just to show you a cone, quite cute, quite small, less, less than a couple of three centimeters really. Um, they will ripen to brown. So people often ask about hemlock. Um, why is it called hemlock? And it's because one of the other species, uh, Canadensis, reputedly smells like the hemlock that killed Socrates and the hemlock that we're all a bit more familiar with perhaps. So that's a very quick gallop through the most common sort of forestry conifers. If you're looking in parks and gardens, you will find a lot more. But remember, it's all about the leaves and how they're attached to the twigs, how they're arranged around the stems. So I haven't touched at all on things in the cupressaceae in the bottom right-hand picture there. So they've got generally scale-like leaves, but not all of them. The top left picture is dawn redwood, and those leaves definitely aren't scale-like, but they, that would be a whole new presentation. But look at the leaves. Let me give you some homework. Um, winter's coming, and we can all get out and about and have a look for some conifers. And just look around your local patch and start recording them. So there's plenty of advice out there, but most importantly, when you've recorded them, get the records to your vice county recorder. Um, for my sins, I'm the conifer referee for the BSBI. And unusually, I don't want you to send me dried pressed specimens. I prefer them fresh, partly because of smell. Smell can be a really useful character, but Get in touch with me, tell me you're going to send me a specimen, pop it in a Ziploc bag, um, preferably with a little bit of slightly damp tissue, and then send it across to me and I'll, I'll do my best to help you out. But please do have a go yourself and see how you get on. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Matt, for that. That was that was brilliant. I'll, I'll be honest, I was scribbling notes into my uh, Collins book there for one or two of your top tips. So. <laughs> Uh, I, like many, have been a bit afraid of conifers for a long time, other than uh, Scots pines. So it's uh, it's great to get some top tips there, which are always very, very helpful, and, and also other uh, books to, to look at. Um, Jim, you might be looking at questions, but I, I was going to ask one first whilst people uh, sit and digest and start uh, typing away. Um, Often when I'm out on site, I'm, I'm coming across them, the conifers, when they're just very, very small, very young and regenerating. Is it fair to say that most of the conifers you've talked about today regenerate quite happily in Britain? They'll spread out from the forest quite easily. Yep, all of those regenerate very happily, indeed. Um, but you can identify them at quite a young age as well. Looking at how the needles are formed and how they're attached to the stem, um, one word of warning with pines, the young needles are single on the very youngest trees, but very quickly you get the adult foliage with those fascicles. That's, that's, good, to, that's good to know. And, and uh, sorry, I'm just going to quickly ask a question on, on that. You were talking about the tops of crowns being different to the bottom of the branches during your talk. Does that yeah. apply to small seedlings as well then? Are, are seedlings, uh, do their lower branches, well, the lower branches don't have many, but... What's, what's the feature there? Um, if, if they're growing in shade or if they're growing in sunlight, they'll, they could have slightly different features, but you'll certainly be able to get them to genus quite quickly. Getting them to species might be a bit more tricky because you're, you're going to get that same differential between sun growth and shade growth. Great. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Jim, have you uh, got a couple of questions to ping out? Uh, yes. Uh... My, that was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, there's lots of complimentary uh, remarks in the Q&A feature. Not too many questions. So uh, whilst uh, the audience is thinking about a few questions to ask you, can I ask, can I pick you up on one thing uh, you said? Not, not in a bad way. Um, <laughs> you said that prickles on lodgepole pine cones are an adaptation to fire. Uh, that's really interesting. How does that work? Okay, I, I misled you, Jim. Um, it's not the prickles. It's that retention onto the, the tree for many years. 
So the cones are there and they generally don't open. They're stuck there and, until a fire comes through the habitat. And that then triggers the release of the opening of the cones and the release of the seeds once the fire has passed through. So it's not the prickles, it's that long-term retention of cones on the tree. Ah, uh, right, I see. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, let me just check. Uh, yeah, I've just, just been going through. Uh, a lot of people have found it very, very informative, uh, Matt, which I suspect you've been so informative that <laughs> you've probably answered a few of the questions. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm just whilst uh, Jim's having a route through, I, I'm going to uh, ask another question if that's all right. You're talking about the hybridization between the Japanese and the European larches, and that the hybrid larch is one of the more common ones in forestry. Uh, are there any other hybrids that we might come across in forestry at all that are commonly out there, to, off the top of your head? Nothing that I know of at the moment. I mean, certainly some odd things are happening. Picera morica, the Serbian spruce, will hybridise with Sitka spruce. Um, I've not seen any in the wild yet. I've only seen them in collections. But given that things like Serbian spruce are starting to be quite common, and they're even considered for forestry species. I mean, there's a couple of hectares of it up near, um, oh, my brain's just died, the old Field Studies Council site in the Highlands. Kondrogan. Kondrogan. Kondrogan, yeah, in the woodland up there, there's quite an extensive plot of Serbian spruce. So we might well start to see more hybrids popping up in future. Uh, can I ask a question, Matt? Uh, should we be worried about Sitka spruce uh, as a rapidly spreading non-native alien species? Uh, uh, wherever I go, I, I see seedlings everywhere, and especially now uh, sheep grazing is being reduced in the highlands. Uh, and you can see seedlings right up to the tops of our mountains. What's going to happen in 20 or 30 years if we ever manage to get on top of the over grazing by deer issue. Wow, yeah. Um, can I take my forest research hat off at this point, put it to one side quietly? Um, it's a very efficient regenerator and for forestry, given that we're slowly switching to something called continuous cover forestry, that makes it highly desirable. Um, but it's actually quite difficult to get enough seedlings surviving underneath forest canopy, but Certainly it spreads, you've just mentioned, you get it up on some quite high parts of hills. Um, there was a tweet earlier today, um, 920 meters Sitka spruce. I mean, at the moment they're, they're quite bottom side. Um, certainly just below the summit of Snowden, there are three or four that are no bigger than footballs and they're probably 20 or 30 years old. But given climate change, yeah, those trees could suddenly start to become viable. Uh, it's a very, I think, legitimate concern um, I've, I've got a few questions here uh, coming in, uh, Matt. Any tips for differentiating silver fur from, seeing that at the end of the day, silver fur from other furs? Okay, um, do they say which silver fur? I'm going to assume they mean European silver fur. They haven't specified. Jim <laughs> uh, McKinnon. Jamie I would Kinnan, imagine, ex, ex, uh, expand if you wish. <laughs> I would imagine it is uh, between. Uh, uh, Abies alba and perhaps grandis. Uh, okay. those, those are the, the two most common and quite tricky to separate uh, furs. Yeah, I agree. Um, look for the buds. Uh, grand fur, as we saw in that talk, has quite small resinous buds. They're quite rounded. Um, European silver fur, Abies alba, has brown papery buds that are slightly pointed. You might get a tiny bit of resin, but nowhere near as much. Now, in shade shoots, it's a bit more tricky looking at the foliage because it, they can look very, very similar. But try and get some foliage which is out in sunlight and in grand fur, I'm going to see if I can use my hands. In grand fur, the foliage sticks out to either side of the shoot. In European silver fur, it, you get two layers. So you get the inner shorter rank slightly sticking up and the outer longer rank stay level. Um, Buds are the key, though, with that one. That's the easiest way to tell them apart. Okay, we've got lots okay. of questions coming in now, Pat, uh, Pat, Matt, uh, <laughs> just getting the time. Um, we can go on for another 10 minutes if you're happy with that. And Jim, you are as well. Yeah. Uh, the next next one, uh, oh, 
on the list is should we record larch hybrids? Personally, I wouldn't because I can't be certain um, unless somebody gets a little handy DNA kit with them. I think it's actually very, very difficult to say with certainty. If you're looking at a hybrid, it's probably more honest to say larynx. Uh, and that applies across any botanizing. If you're not certain, go up to the taxonomic level you are certain of. But can I ask a question that almost any relatively young uh, larch plantation is going to be the hybrid, isn't it? Because they haven't been plant planting true Japanese larch or European larch uh, for years. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right there, Jim. It is, and, and that's going to be usually an F1 hybrid because it's going to have come from a supplier. Uh, but also at the moment, larch is under a, a huge pressure from Phytophthora remorum. So there is a moratorium on planting it, certainly in Scotland and down in Wales. So we won't see any fresh new plantations of it, uh, but it will self-seed still. And there's a... Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, there's Jim. No, uh, there's no Pinus uh, contorta being planted now either. So that only Correct. means Sitka spruce has been planted. And Scots pine as well. Oh, and Scots pine, okay. European silver fir, grand fir. Um, so we've still got a few things being planted, definitely. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on. This is a very quick question, but uh, it's going to be asked. What's your favorite Christmas tree, Matt? It's coming in. Good grief, that's so unfair. I don't have a Christmas tree. <laughs> um, I would go for one of the furs. Fraser is getting very popular now. It has some very attractive cones and it smells good. Okay, no, no, that's, that's, that's good. Uh, I'm just moving down. Some of these kind of, kind of vary between taxonomic and general, but uh, if you can answer general knowledge ones, it's, it's been a long day, so it's quite nice to get these as well. Uh, long but interesting, isn't it? Uh, commercial food pine kernels. Which pines do they come from? Oh, okay. So this used to be Pinus pioneer um, from the Mediterranean, but nowadays they're pretty much all Pinus coriensis and they're sourced in China. Oh, okay, that's good to know. Uh, next one on the list, um, oh, could be a big one this one actually. Other than hybridisation, what are the biggest threat to Scottish or British conifers that we must watch out for? I must admit, having been involved mapping out areas for conifers, uh, it sometimes seems the other way, but yeah, what's the biggest threats would you see? Okay, um, I've mentioned them already, Phytophthora, um, fungus-like pathogen, which has already ripped through uh, what's it, Phytophthora, oh, I think lateralis in juniper. It's a really big problem with native juniper woodland. And it's unfortunately it's spread in soil. And as botanists, we're going between sites. We have our boots on and we carry that soil with us. So, for example, if you're visiting different juniper sites, clean your boots. Even if it's just washing them off in a stream or something, clean the soil off your boots between sites. Um, the problem with Phytophthoras is they, they hybridize and they become pathogenic. And we're seeing them moving into all manner of trees now. So things like Lawson Cypress, they're already an older horse chestnut. Uh, they're affecting so many different species. Um, with the pines, really at the moment, we're looking at Dothostroma needle blight, red band needle blight, which predominantly hammers things like Corsican pine and lodgepole pine, but it will jump to other species as well. It doesn't seem to cause as much damage at the moment, but that's not to say it won't in the future. And tacked onto the back of that, we're also seeing insect pests. Um, in Scotland, we're probably a bit sort of shielded from it to some extent because they tend to be coming up from the warmer parts of the country. But certainly in future, we're going to need to be keeping our eyes open very much for things like bark beetles, which have caused huge problems elsewhere in the world and in Europe. Um, Ips topographus in mainland Europe has wiped out quite big areas of Norway spruce, for example. Uh, thanks. Can, can, can I just jump in there and ask you a question about juniper, which you mentioned? Uh, this is one from Duncan Donald, uh, and something I've always puzzled about. Uh, do you approve of the separation of our native juniper into two subspecies? 
I think the official line is three subspecies in stace. Am I right in thinking that? So Hemisterica um, yes. and two, Communis. Two more common and one less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I prefer Fajon's approach, which says two subspecies, uh, Satellis and Communis. And that seems to work better for me. Um, I wonder how many records, and this is me being speculative, how many records are based on location rather than actual features present? Yes, that's a good point, because when you see a juniper uh, on a hilltop, you tend to assume it must be Nana. Uh, and if it's growing luxuriantly in some pine wood in the Spey Valley, it's, it's going to be Kuminus. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say I, I'm a bit of a lumper, so I quite like Fajon's classification, but I think it's very difficult to tell them apart. It is possible, but it's difficult. Thank you. Good to know. I've got uh, another question here. Giant cones, Monterey pine usually. What if a huge cone has not got an offset point of attachment, i.e. central? What species is it likely to be? Do you, want me to, do you want me to repeat that one? Yeah, please. Uh, giant cones, Monterey pine usually. What if a huge cone has not got an offset point of attachment, i.e. central? What species is it likely to be? Okay, I think you need to check the needles. So are they in twos or threes? Uh, Monterey pine, Pinus radiata is usually threes. Um, if it's a two needle pine, which I suspect it will be, the needles will be very long, um, very stiff. Uh, it's likely to be Pinus pinasta, I think. That's the most likely candidate. They, they're much more tapered and a bit more knobbly than Pinus radiata, but that's my first guess. So send me some photos, whoever asked the question. It was Eric Jensen. So Eric, uh, over, over to you for, if you want to get in contact with Matt on, on that one. Uh, we've got about three more minutes. So Jim, is, have you picked up on another? You're right, Matt, again. you're getting all these. I'm starting to wilt here. <laughs> <laughs> you said the beer yeah, after you I, shortly. I've got a great <laughs> question for you, Matt. So one which I've always wondered about, uh, is it possible to, this is from David uh, Elston, is it possible to breed uh, conifer varieties that do not regenerate well in Scotland or indeed the UK? Sorry, Jim, could you repeat the first part of that question? Would it be possible to breed conifer varieties that do not regenerate uh, or self-regenerate uh, well in the UK to, av to avoid this uh, spread of species like Sitka spruce into the, the wider countryside? So uh, that's certainly possible. Um, a lot of Sitka spruce that's planted is vegetatively propagated because it's got a more desirable form and better timber qualities, for example. And in Japan, uh, the most the, far and away, the most common conifer species in plantation is Japanese cedar, Cryptomeria japonica. And they've discovered in recent years, there's been a huge increase in quite serious allergic reactions to the pollen from that. So they've selected a variety which doesn't produce male pollen. And that's now planted at, at a premium in Japanese forests to try and reduce that. So that's something we could do. So you're, you're really going to love this. Leylandii has been considered as a forestry species because it's a sterile hybrid at the moment. Um, so that yes, it's certainly possible. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. As, as a chair, I'm supposed to be impartial, but I'm going, no, <laughs> I want to hear of that one. Um, I've got another one here, which probably could be a conference in its own, Matt, so I, I don't know, but it's certainly uh, it's, it's cropping up more and more in the news uh, from, from Monica Griesbaum. Um, what do we know about the benefits of conifers taking climate change into account? How do they do compared to a mixed native broadleaf in terms of CO2 reduction? And biodiversity. I mean, oof, that's it's quite it's quite a big one. What's what's your what's what's your kind of general general feel on that? I know there's been papers out there about biodiversity of conifer forests actually not being as bad as, as you think at times. But um, no, no um, the biodiversity I can probably tackle more easily. That mm -hmm. from the point of view of carbon sinks, I, you're going to have to refer to some papers on that. Biodiversity wise, one point I think it's really important to make is that. Forestry, although it's largely still this grow and cut single rotation 
approach where you just clear fell the whole site. Things are changing a bit. And this idea of continuous cover forestry where you get a multiple mixed age structure is coming in. That lets in quite a bit more light and you tend to get a lot more ground floor underneath that. Um, even with the exotic conifers, that happens. So I think that's a positive. I think the other thing in that is going to come in in the future is we're going to be looking more at mixed species stands because a monoculture is at a huge risk from insect or disease attack. And again, the more diverse the species are within that stand, even if they're different exotic conifers, we're going to see a greater diversity. And probably a, a good example here is, and unfortunately this work hasn't been published, but there was a, a study of hoverfly larvae in Sitka spruce canopy compared to a nearby mixed broadleaf woodland. And there were far more species of hoverfly in the Sitka spruce canopy than the mixed broadleaf. And that's down to the aphids that usually infest conifer canopies. So the hoverflies feeding on those, they were actually having absolute ball. But a bit like a tropical rainforest, there's not a lot happening on the forest floor. You've got to get up in the canopy to see where the diversity is. So it may not help plant diversity on the ground, but insect diversity certainly can be pretty good in conifer forests. Great. I believe fungi as well aren't too bad. I remember uh, a yeah. paper about that. They're actually pretty diverse. Uh, much, yeah, much absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are we, we're almost at the end. Uh, I'll just see if there's any more questions. Oh, it's come off my screen. Um, I'll just read out something at the moment, Jim. I don't know if you can read uh, David's last one, but Peter Gordon says, I have a record of a Norway spruce at 1,085 metres on Ben McDewey last year. Perhaps my highest showing potential for spread well away from the source brackets. I want to check again that it's not Sitka though. Um, yeah, I suspect it's probably a Sitka. <laughs> <laughs> and David Elston has come back uh, about that question uh, about trying to breed varieties that are self-sterile. Um, and he says, if it's possible to do, why isn't it done? It hasn't been considered an issue until relatively recently. And breeding trees takes time quite often because it takes them a long time to cope. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of forestry managers actually want to have things that are going to regenerate. It, planting trees costs a lot of money. So if you can get a forestry system that self-regenerates, it, it, it tends to be the way people are looking at going. Now, I, I just fear for the, the wider countryside uh, in the long term being covered with uh, Sitka spruce. Um, Yep, I mean, unfortunately, we're a, a really good niche for it. I mean, you've only got to look at things like Pinus radiata. It's, it's native to a very small peninsula on the west coast of North America. And it's stunted, it's horrible, it's a manky looking thing. But it's now the most widely planted conifer in the world. And it's gone invasive in New Zealand, South Africa, South America. It's, and it, it's because it's been taken out of this refugia, if you like, and put somewhere where it's absolutely very happy. Uh, and Sitka spruce, unfortunately, loves loves the British Isles. Really loves it. Yeah, I'd certainly second that from seeing regeneration on some bogs of late. Um, I'm just going to nip in this last question, and that'll be us, Matt, and, and well done for for answering these so so well. Uh, Michael Phillip, how about Pinus nigra? Nigra. Okay. Um, when you say what about it? <laughs> That's all he said. I don't anything know. else? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe uh, is there anything topical about it? That's uh, maybe it's, it's okay. So, this question. Pinus nigra is split into variable numbers of subspecies uh, or varieties depending on the taxonomy of the day. It'll probably change next week. Um, widely planted in the British Isles in general was Pinus nigra subspecies Lorizio or Corsican pine. There's a moratorium on planting it because it is highly susceptible to Dothostroma or red band needle blight, but it's still out there. Um, and you do get some very big mature trees of the other subspecies, Pinus nigra nigra, Austrian pine or black pine. And you get those in the boundaries of old stately homes and things, very much a nice spreading tree, beautiful actually. So they are still out there. Um, if there's any more questions on that, probably just drop me a line and I'll try and answer. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've given that message out, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you off the hook now, uh, Matt. Um, 
many many thanks for that and also chris as well many thanks the the, the workshops have been brilliant absolutely brilliant this afternoon so thanks very much for your time uh, you. on 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 that one